Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like uh, the, the grid is, is, is a major player here in terms of, of uh, how, do we, how do we get to the transition. So if I, can, if I may, I'd like to ask some questions about uh, how the grid is operated today and, and, and what we need to do um, uh, in the future to each of, for each of you. Um, uh, I think, Eric, uh, could you talk a little bit about how power is dispatched and uh, also about uh, um, the concept of peak demand um, and also talk about uh, uh, recognizing how different states have a much higher mix of, of renewables. Texas, for instance, is 15% uh, of their energy mix is from wind. Uh, California has 21% uh, hydro, 11% solar, and 7% wind, and 6% geothermal. And even within uh, locally, um, uh, North Carolina, North Carolina has 4.3% uh, uh, solar and 3.6% hydro versus 0.4% for Virginia. So, Eric? Well, sure, I'll try to be somewhat brief, at, um, but essentially the way power is dispatched, if you will. Um, so the whole, we have a series of interconnected grids in the country. This one is run by PJM that Virginia's in. Uh, and those, what, what are known as independent system operators, these people kind of control the flow of electricity to make sure that the system always has, right, enough supply to meet demand. You can never have more supply than demand or more demand than supply where things uh, don't work very well. So you have to constantly keep it in balance. And so uh, being able to generally look ahead, system operators are able to sort of look ahead and predict what the demand amount is going to be uh, for the next day. And so people, companies, bid in their resources, uh, sort of, if you will, like I can provide X amount of power at Y price. And those, if you will, kind of get stacked up from least cost to highest cost. And where that stack sort of intersects what they think the demand is gonna be, well, then everything below that is what generally gets dispatched. That's what you're gonna call on to run that day to meet power. Now, of course, there may be some you know, blips during the day and you have to call on some additional resources or call or, or have things uh, back down. But generally that's how it's dispatched uh, in organized markets like PJM, but really even uh, in markets where you don't have somebody like that, uh, but even so out in California, it's done by the California Independent System Operator or the Cal ISO, same, same basic deal. You bid in the power. And so of course the lowest cost power um, is always gonna get dispatched and that generally tends to be these days renewable energy, um, natural gas, uh, various flavors, uh, and then you start to move up, maybe it'd be you know, coal and nuclear and then eventually you get you know, kind of off in the resource mix with uh, higher emitting, less efficient, more expensive energy. So that's kind of how things get dispatched um, and I'm sure probably Kathy can give us a, a better uh, explanation or even my other panelists, but that maybe in a nutshell is kind of the basics of how it works. Uh, just so uh, quickly in California, I mean, it's the same system there. Of course, not all states are blessed by the same amount of renewables, and of course, not all states have the same amount even of certain types of renewables, right? So California uh, has a fair amount of hydro and is able to tap into a lot of hydro in the Northwest, but they also have, you know, a lot of solar down in the desert area uh, and a fair amount of wind that they can call on. Different states have different mixes of that, right? And some states are, are not blessed with much, or some have maybe solar, but not much wind, uh, et cetera. I would say one interesting lesson from California, I think, is that they have, so they've looked at their system, and I think it's um, about 30% right now renewables. They've looked at the system, and the system operator and others have started to raise some concerns about what happens when you get up to 50% renewable power running on the system, and how, how easy is it to kind of keep that thing balance, right? Because if you're relying on wind and it stops blowing, you have to have something immediately provide that same amount of power, right? Like immediately. So it's always a gas plant that can follow it because those can start up really quickly. So one thing they've seen in California is they got, they have so many renewables on the system that they've actually created a whole market with other states called an energy imbalance market where some of this excess solar and excess renewable energy, instead of having, you know, so instead of sort of putting all that on the California system, they can now sort of spread some of that out. It goes into, I think, Nevada, maybe even into Oregon, to Arizona. So there they're actually able to take then all of the 
renewables that are going on in California, and through this arrangement that they've worked out, and it's really kind of a self-created mechanism, they've been able to sort of spread some of that renewable power out. It keeps the system running a bit smoother, but it also then increases the reach of some of that renewable power. Uh, and then in, in Texas, I mean, they're blessed with lots of wind. That means they also have a lot of gas plants to back up that wind. Uh, they have interesting phenomena there, like negative pricing at night because wind power is bid in at a below price because of the current subsidy, the production tax credit subsidy. Um, so there they rely a lot on wind, but that market itself has seen some strains even this summer. Uh, they were very close just because they had, I think, a they didn't quite accurately forecast a certain gap, and when they lost the wind, they were calling on lots and lots of resources to come online, and so they actually had to go into a different market outside their own market in Texas, ERCOT. They had to reach into a different market to purchase some power to keep the system running. So, you know, I'm not saying that's a consequence of the renewable energy, but it's just something that you have to take into account, right, as you bring on more renewables into a system. Um, you know, you've got to always keep it balanced, and that can have uh, sometimes different types of consequences, depending on, of course, the amount of renewables you even have available. Um, Catherine, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think Eric wrapped it up very nicely. I think this is, this is just an important point. Eric did a phenomenal job of simplifying something that's incredibly complicated, <laughs> and it still sounds incredibly complicated. Yeah. <laughs> that is... That just shows the complexity of uh, the energy economy and the electricity sector. Um, Eric has been doing this for a long time, I can tell, um, and he gets it. It is very, very complicated. And so as we think about these, these, these complex issues that attempt to be simplified, it's not an easy task, and solving those complex problems is an even more difficult task. So I, I think this is a good example of how Eric did a good job of making something very complicated sound simple, but it still sounded very complicated. And, and so it is it is a complex question and, and it's a complex industry. So I mean, and I'll add to that, maybe just with a, sort of an anecdotal example. Um, when you flip a light switch at your house, what you do is you're drawing on additional energy. So what you've told the, the grid is, okay, I need you to ramp up just a little bit. So on our end, We've got to have something ready to fill in that gap right away because you don't want to turn the light switch on and have it come on in five or ten minutes, <laughs> however long it takes us to react. The expectation is it's absolutely instantaneous. We'll multiply that by two and a half million people who all get home from work at about the same time, who are cooking dinner, doing laundry, turning on light switches throughout their homes, maybe turning their air conditioning down or their heat up. But we've got to be there instantaneously to meet that demand. So we're constantly monitoring what's happening near and around your homes and our resources and other resources. In Virginia, in large part with a grid that was designed many, many decades ago, as others have said, with these very large power plants in centralized locations, sending energy out in one direction. Um, so it's important that, to Eric's point, you don't have too little energy to meet your demand or your lights don't come on. We also can't have too much because we don't wanna create any type of surge situations either. Um, but in its very most simplistic example, how that relates to renewable energy is think about solar panels on a rooftop on a day when cloud cover comes and goes. So even though you might not be doing anything any differently at your home, you might be at work, your home might be empty. Um, you're not doing anything any differently, but what's winding up happening is instead of somebody that's sitting back with their hand on a switch controlling whether there's more or less generation, there's clouds coming and going. So our grid's got to be in a position where we can accept that energy and send it out to whoever needs it uh, and control the voltage so it doesn't cause any types of surges or, or any other situations that might, um, might inadvertently re uh, create reliability issues. Um, but we've got to be willing to be there. We have to have the technology to, to allow us to ramp up and ramp down every time you or two and a half million other people turn their light switches on and off. <laughs> uh, sure, go ahead. Well, just a couple of very, really quick points. I think one of the simple things that, that I've heard described is essentially our grid over decades was designed for energy to flow in one direction. And now we have to look at a grid that can flow in both directions. There's actually circuitry and electronics that are affected by that. But coming back to this idea of management, so the, the, what you described is sort of this, I'm managing from my side of supply, but what we're gonna need in the future is it's gonna be a combination of demand and supply management. So in the future, instead of saying, I'm gonna match my supply to meet my demand, 
I'm going to have a good component that's saying I'm meeting my demand to match what my actual supply is. And so if you thought what I said was complicated, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> that's, no, that's an excellent point. Um, well, we, we, part of the, the, the issue here is then it gets into the storage component. And one thing that was interesting that I read about is, is that in Virginia, we actually have a pump storage facility. Um, could you explain how that works in terms of, of, of uh, balancing the, the grid? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I think one, just, just to sort of lay a little bit of context first for why some of this stuff is so important, right? I mean, you've, you've heard some of these examples. The, world, the, the electric grid is essentially the world's largest supply chain, right? And, and electricity is sort of mysterious, and so maybe it's easier to think about like sort of, you know, making and moving physical things, right? So on this world's largest supply chain, there are no warehouses, right? Think about the chaos that would ensue if you were, if it was like suddenly illegal to warehouse physical goods, right? So if you had, you know, I know a lot of people in this room will probably celebrate Christmas here in a few months. What would the roads and the truck situation be like if we had to make and move and deliver all of those, you know, those goods, those presents on Christmas day, right? You'd have to have roads that were like 50 lanes wide. And so, of course, we don't need this. You can put presents under your tree, you can put them in the store, you can put them in the warehouse. So when people are talking about things like pump storage hydro or, or other types of energy storage, that's why it's so important. It's because it's the, the warehouse for the electric grid, right? And you need to be able, if there's, if there's times when there is too much power, you need to be able to store it. And if there's times when there's too little, you need to be able to, to, you know, to, to take it out, to take a, to take a, a withdrawal from there. Um, the challenge with some of these pumps, pump hydro uh, facilities is essentially twofold. One is they don't tend to be near large load centers. So it, and you can clearly see that in Virginia, we use much more power here up north and the store and the, and the hydro is down south. Um, and the other one is they're sort of a victim of their own success. They're actually so good that, that substantially all of the hydro resources have like already been developed. So if we're talking about you know, building on, onto the grid and, and needing these to meet the challenges, uh, we're gonna have to, to start to look elsewhere, you know, because there's not, there's not that many more sort of exploitable resources um, you know, left, left, left to be had. Could I uh, just add to that? Um, Dominion operates a uh, pump hydro storage facility in Bath County. And um, the, the simplest way I can think of to describe it is think about it, you've got two really big reservoirs of water. One sits higher than the other. And when you have excess generation, so in the example of whatever that might be, maybe overnight, you have excess generation, and you, when you have more energy than you need because your uh, customers aren't consuming as much, you pump high, you pump the water from the lower reservoir up to the upper reservoir, and you basically hold it there. So if you've ever seen like a hydroelectric dam, you then release the water, and it generates energy, energy when you need it. So it serves as a very, very large battery. The one in Bath County is um, the equivalent of about 3,000 megawatts, and one megawatt serves about 250 average size homes. It's been called the world's largest battery for a few decades. It's actually been in place for some time now. Um, but the benefits are, in, in that kind of scenario, you can actually store a very large amount of energy in one location. The downside is, to your point, it tends to be away from um, large um, con areas that are concentrated population areas. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, which, um, Case, um, can you talk about how wind power can be worked in, in terms of the, how it would work with the generation and how does it work in Europe, for instance? Yeah, so um, we were the first <coughs> company to install offshore wind turbines in the world. Uh, surprisingly, in 1991, um, they were about 450 kilowatts each. Um, the entire wind farm, which was just decommissioned last year, uh, it's the first one to be decommissioned, so taken out of service. Um, one wind turbine today generates the amount of electricity that that entire wind farm could in a year in 18 days. So the technology has iterated and innovated tremendously over the last 25 years. None of that is in the U.S. today. Um, for various reasons, uh, it just has not, uh, it has not quite caught on. 
but we're at a tipping point now where um, we will be seeing large scale megawatts of offshore wind in the US in the next three to five years. Uh, the Northeast is doing a lot of this work. The value of offshore wind for the US particularly, there, there are a lot of uh, benefits to it, but maybe one or two I'll, I will focus on for the purposes of this question is, um, it's off the coast. So when we think about the use of, of land uh, or the need for large scale transmission infrastructure to go across large areas, uh, that is minimized because it's, it's off the coast. The other is a lot of our population and a lot of our load centers are on the coast, on the east coast. And so that provides um, a significant power resource that has not yet been tapped into to serve those large load, cent load centers, New York City, Philadelphia, um, New Jersey, Virginia, Hampton Roads. Um, and that presents a, a big opportunity as we start to not start, as we continue to realize the challenges of, of large scale infrastructure deployment on land. And so when we think about uh, what that means for our grid, that is another large scale resource that needs to be plugged in to the grid and so you have to do some improvements. But it, again, it, it does provide a large scale new untapped resource um, to provide electricity, to provide energy uh, to large load centers where people are consuming a lot of uh, electricity. So uh, it really is another kind of um, energy boom opportunity uh, for, for the US. And this project that Hayes is talking about, the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project that we're working on together, um, just to put it in perspective, one turbine is taller than the Washington Monument, just for visual reference. Um, I, um, what can you can you talk, or actually either one, either Scott or Ivy, do you want to talk about distributed power generation and, and how that's going to work with the mix, especially with the solar? It's going to be much more a, a different concept in terms of how the the pipes are going to work. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the great things that has happened in the last few years is that the cost of solar energy has come down and now utility scale, scale solar is, uh, I mean, you just said that the cheapest new resource in the state. Um, and that is when you want bulk power, that is fantastic. We are, um, we're so excited about that. But there is also a huge opportunity for uh, rooftop solar and one where you're not having to uh, use land you can uh, use the electricity right where you're producing it um, and you can use then private investment as customers to build their own uh, solar panels so um, the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimated our total solar potential on rooftop uh, at something like 38% of our total electricity supply. So it is, a, it is a huge opportunity. It's a big economic opportunity because uh, rooftop solar generates a lot of jobs, um, more than utility scale, because you, you need more, um, more, more hands in a smaller area. Um, so so it, is, it has to be part of it. If you're looking to get to 100%, um, that distributed generation has got to be a big part of it. Uh, as we we're talking about the grid right now, um, you, you've got to be able to get your, your grid flowing both ways. We do need a modernized grid that is capable of handling that, but uh, there's, there's a big opportunity right now, as Catherine says, we've already got 3,000 megawatts of of pump storage in the state. Uh, PJM has said it could handle uh, up to 30% of wind and solar without too much trouble today. So, so we've got a big, big opportunity that we don't need to wait around for while we're up, upgrading the grid. This is something we could be working on now. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, the only thing I would add to that is that we have such low penetration of those resources. In terms of these grid concerns, we're a real long way away from that. Um, NREL did a study that looked at the eastern grid, which is going from sort of the Midwest, the east, to Canada, far New Mexico, and it, it said that you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% with not a huge amount of inter interconnectivity upgrades is feasible with these variable resources. So 
we're a long way from 30% in terms of distributed resources. And so there's plenty of opportunity there and there's lots of, I think, pent up demand within the market. I think some of the things we have to look at there too are the incentives and the regulations and the limit, limitations on that. When we look at states around us, they have better um, incentives for consumers to do that work. Okay, Eric. I just wanted to add on those excellent comments. Uh, just on the universal solar, one, I think one of the great aspects of universal solar um, is that it's a way of bringing clean energy to all communities, including those that are underserved, and that often kind of gets overlooked in all of this, you know. The panels are, are, are a great thing too, uh, and those are certainly have applicability, uh, but that's one of the nice things about universal or universal scale solar. Uh, you can really kind of distribute that benefit throughout the community. Uh, and I think talking, of, and I think the point was, you know, excellent, well made, and, and I just want to bring us back to this sort of the need to strengthen the grid, right? Because we're building a grid that flows two ways, but imagine now, so my world that I described is pretty complicated, right? And now we're adding these resources that are going both ways, right? When you have a rooftop panel, it's putting on and taking off and you're doing all kinds of stuff. So it really speaks to a key element of, of reaching any of these goals is really you know, finding the policies and the, and the prescription to be able to enhance this, uh, that grid and modernize it so that we can bring uh, even more of this onto the system and, and keep it functioning. So I just wanted to throw that in. Um, okay, it, 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 it sounds like we have a, a universal agreement that the basic technologies are available to get us to 100% um, renewable. Um, but I want to try to drill down a little bit more and, and really look at, at what, what are the real, um, uh, what's, what's realistic in, in the time frame that we're talking about. Um, Hayes. I was looking at a study, um, a DOE wind vision report, uh, which is March 2015, um, talked about uh, offshore wind in Virginia could provide uh, 170,000 gigawatts per year, uh, which is about one and a half times what our current demand is. Um, is that realistic by 2035, or is this is that kind of too, that's too much of a goal? Uh, the realistic for just offshore wind to supply that? Yeah, uh, um, there, there's very little onshore wind in Virginia, yeah. so. Um, it would be great. <laughs> I, I would still have a job, which would be terrific. <laughs> um, th there are some practical considerations. And, and, and you know, I, as I was thinking about um, some of the, some of the practical components of getting to 100% renewable, I jotted down a list of, of about nine or 10 things that I see are, um, are important to provide context. But for the purposes of offshore wind, one of the practical considerations is um, there's only one area off the coast of Virginia right now that's permitted to, to have offshore wind placed in it. The meaning holds the lease for it. Um, it this is, I always find this an interesting fact. The federal government actually owns the bottom of the ocean the sea floor, out to about 200 miles, 200 miles. Um, so if you want to use the bottom of the sea floor, you have to talk to the federal government. These lease areas, when we talk about an area off the coast of Virginia that is currently permitted to, to put offshore wind on, it's actually the sea floor, the outer continental shelf, that the federal government has signed a lease with Dominion to be able to actually stick these turbines into the ground. It's about 113,000 acres. Um, on the East Coast, generally, it has very favorable conditions because you can go really far out and still be relatively shallow, about 90 feet deep, about 27 miles off the coast of Virginia, uh, which is very, very good for offshore wind. Um, so Dominion holds that area. That area today, given the technology, can uh, hold at least 2,000 megawatts. 2,000 megawatts is, I don't know what, 10%, uh, 12% of what, uh, Virginia consumes on an annual basis. So if we t take that and we expand it out, there's some practical considerations there. We have the, the busiest military waters in the country off the coast of Virginia. We love our military in Virginia. They're an economic driver. Uh, they are important to our national security. And so we as a developer and Dominion as the leaseholder, we need to be cognizant of, of the neighbors out there and make sure that we're not interfering with the things we know about, and we're not interfering with the things we don't know about, which are 
certainly happening out there. And so there are some practical considerations with respect to saying what is technically feasible and what is actually feasible in terms of deployment. Would us as Orsted love to put turbines all up and down the East Coast and power Virginia um, with that? Absolutely, and, and we could certainly do it. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're living, um, we're living appropriately with our neighbors to provide the resource. And you know, maybe this is me cutting my, cutting my own uh, resource off at the knees, but you know, fuel diversity is actually an important thing. And when we think about where wind is and solar and storage, um, and even nuclear in, in Virginia, um, these are resources that it's important not to put all your eggs in one basket. And so when we think about what that means for offshore wind, it's important to know that it plays well with others, um, but it doesn't have to be the only end-all, be-all resource for Virginia to, to power its operations. Okay, um, Ivy, um, similarly, uh, we have solar energy, it has tremendous potential in Virginia, um, more than enough to supply all of our needs. Um, uh, the the um, uh, solutions project indicated that uh, we could get uh, 38, which calls for 100% renewable by, by 2050, uh, says it calls for 38% uh, of the energy coming from solar from various different types of solar. Um, do you see, do you think that's reasonable for Virginia as a goal? Um, do you think we can do better than that? Uh, and what technologies are needed? Um, sure, uh, yep, because we know uh, we know we've got the the resource <laughs> potential here. Um, you have to. There are things like people's uh, people with old roofs aren't going to put solar on. So there's there's it's going to take a little while. You and you need the right incentives. There are a whole lot of barriers at the moment to um, the customer sided solar. Uh, different things you can and cannot do, uh, and we need to. We need to clean those away. There's, they're, they're, they are not um, technical limitations. They're policy limits, and so we we need to work on those. Um, something about the technology. The solar panel technology has gotten in, increasingly better. Um, and and one thing I'm reminded of is that you know it was only like 15 years ago that uh, cell phones started having cameras on them. And if you remember, they were really, really crummy quality, <laughs> and the cell phones were really, really expensive. And you know, I said at the time that that the only people who could afford this would be teenagers, right? Nobody else would do this. <laughs> and and you know, and, and today, th th I bought my latest um, iPhone because it had such a fabulous camera. And and we have to realize that the technology doesn't stop with where we are today. What's going to happen in the next fifteen years are uh, is going to be just tremendously better and we're, we're seeing the the kind of pace of technological developments in solar and, and battery storage in particular um, that that are, are like the computer um, improvements and and so when we say yeah it's gonna it's gonna take a while to get there we have to remember the technology is getting what is, is going much faster than than we can predict today so um, it will happen, even if it seems now kind of slow and halting. Scott, it looks like you're, you're chafing a bit. Well, well, I just think that's an excellent point. You know, the technology is going to go in places we don't know, and so we're looking at a lot of uncertainty about the future. And what we know about technology innovation is tended to, we tend to underest we tend to overestimate the near term advancement, and we underestimate the long term advancement. So. To me, that's part of the argument of saying not closing any doors on any technology because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. You know, a year ago, the things I was reading about carbon capture were like, this is so far off. We can do carbon capture now, it's just very expensive. Um, but now there's technologies and ideas that maybe in five or 10 years, we're going to have affordable carbon capture solutions as well as if we get a price on carbon, that's going to change that game. So I think Ivy's correct. There's a lot of things that are going to happen, change maybe in some ways faster than we think in ways we don't even imagine today. So I think that's a real good point. Will, do you have, want to say something about the, the battery technologies and, and uh, what we need there? Yeah, I do, right? because I think that the, I guess the, the, the buzzword that I want to introduce into this discussion here is renewable firming, right? So we've talked a lot about wind, we've talked a lot about solar, but these are, as we've pointed out a few times, sort of intermittent resources, right? 
And we've made the point already that with that management resource, the second it gets cloudy or dark, there has to be a resource standing by. So the way that we firm up these resources today is with is with largely with gas peaker plants, right? So this creates this strange link now between clean and dirty power. So the pathway to getting to, you know, to building out more renewables and making them, you know, truly work for us, truly to, to the, like take away the car, you know, these, these carbon uh, resources that we're using today is with renewable firming, right? With ways like battery storage. And I would say mostly like distributed battery storage because we want to put all of these resources, the solar and the batteries sort of as close to the load as possible because that's where we use the power and that's where they do the most good. A little behind here, so, so I'm going to try to combine some stuff here. Um, the uh, uh, I want to pick up on on something that that uh, um, uh, that you mentioned, Hoss. Um, the the uh, the issue about siting. Uh, I know that siting is is an important issue on the wind turbine side, on the <coughs> offshore wind side, um, and I understand that siting has also been an, a challenge for for Dominion on on the the, the um, um, uh, the large scale uh, solar projects. And so I want to give you both an opportunity to talk about the, the, the difficulties about siting and, and uh, what we can, you know, what, what are the challenges there? I'll, you want to get started? Or? So from a, a solar perspective, I'll, yeah. I'll address solar then wind. Um, so from a solar perspective, we've seen some um, concerns um, increasing numbers of concerns related to um, the siting of larger scale solar projects in certain locations. Um, and the concerns vary from people who don't want to look at it, um, people who frankly don't understand the technology. Um, we've heard questions come in, um, everything from is having a solar farm nearby going to affect my own garden? Um, and so I think there's education, I think we can all probably agree that education needs to take place. Um, and I'd also say that we're hearing uh, additional questions as it relates to the decommissioning, please mention decommissioning of um, wind. Um, when solar is, uh, completes its, the end of its useful life, what happens to it at the, at the end? Um, and, and, um, and, and removing that and restoring the land to sort of its original use. Um, so those are some of the questions we've got. And other questions also deal with tax policy, which we won't go into. Um, but I think some of the same concerns arose um, related to uh, a wind project that was in uh, Tazewell County that Dominion pursued a number of years ago. Um, and concerns related to noise, uh, potential impacts to birds and bats. And to Hayes's point, 27 miles off the coast is ideal for it presents certain challenges, but is ideal for other reasons. One of those is that from a line of sight perspective, it, you know, we say it can be very, barely visible from, from shore, and it's also outside um, the distance where migratory birds and bats and so forth um, tend to stay. They tend to stay closer to the shore. So for that reason, the project that Hayes and I both talked about is really instrumental and a, and a very important first step in pursuing more wind development in Virginia. Yeah, so uh, the thing, uh, w one thing about uh, offshore wind from a siting standpoint that is positive is, um, or it, maybe I will say is a contrast to what we're seeing on land, uh, the process by which um, issues or concerns that may arise by users of the water is very centralized uh, at the federal level. And so that conversation can happen among the people who are interested, uh, uh, stakeholders, commercial fisheries, shipping, uh, military, as I as I mentioned, it can all happen at an essentially essentially centralized and, and singular conversation. Um, and now I'll take my offshore wind hat on and put my previous hat uh, on as uh, uh, public sector energy policy. What we saw onshore with solar was it got down to a to the state level conversation about the desire to see more solar, and then it went down to the local level and the localities. <coughs> We have 127 localities and jurisdictions in Virginia. So if you're talking about siting solar facilities and you want to do it in five counties, you got to go talk to five different governments. If you want to do it in one county where the land straddles a line, you got to talk to two, at least two different governments. And so that creates some, some real challenges, certainly not insurmountable challenges, uh, because I, I think we will see and we are seeing localities who are getting educated and understanding the benefits. Uh, but those are some of the challenges. 
and we'll take that and we'll go back because it always comes back to the grid, right? Siting and installing large scale, long distance transmission infrastructure is really, really difficult. It is very difficult. We need to, the grid has to go through oftentimes to get to load centers, people who are living in and around the load centers. And so siting those and getting those installed is an additional siting concern beyond the challenges of just actually putting in uh, the, the generation resource. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it also, in the energy efficiency space, calls for the utilities, for Dominion in particular, to undertake a billion dollars, almost a billion dollars um, worth of either applications to the State Corporation Commission um, or provided at no cost to low-income, elderly, disabled, and veteran customers. Um, so the legislation itself will be transformative. A lot of the technology we've talked about, everything from um, energy storage pilots to modernizing the grid to giving our customers better tools to help control their own energies, all dependent upon um, grid modernization and other topics that were covered by that legislation. Ivy, do you want to say something about it? I gave you a chance to reply to that. Well, it's not, um, you know, part of, Part of the problem is that that's not a mandatory thing. So that's a, a public interest declaration, makes it easier, uh, but doesn't guarantee anything. And there again, because it's, it's not um, an RPS, the SEC will expect Dominion to sell those wrecks to a state like Maryland, and we will still have no, legally, any, any solar here. Uh, and and that's, that is a bit of an issue. Um, but it's also not nearly enough. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it, it isn't getting us anywhere near that 100% number by 2035. And, and all of the plans Dominion has, which are much, much better than uh, they were just a couple of years ago, still aren't, aren't anywhere near where we would need to be. Um, so if, if we're gonna be serious, an RPS would be a great way to do it, and it's and it would need to be an, a much more aggressive than any of our current plans. Eric, getting. Quick. Yeah, just real quick, I would say one of the benefits of RPSs across the nation, I think 29 states currently have a renewable portfolio standard, is it has allowed those states to really tap into the different mix of renewable resources they all have, and every state has a different mix. More sun, more wind, more geothermal, more biomass, more all kinds of different things. And so that's one of the nice things about that is it lets all these sort of uh, areas flourish where they, where they can. Uh, and I think it helps avoid um, some of the sort of lock-in that we were talking about. We don't know where technology is headed and we don't know if the solution is just wind and solar. Certainly very promising, right? But there could be a mix of all kinds of things that are even more promising that get us to zero carbon. So, uh, I, you know, certainly nothing wrong with trying to push that needle. I think it's good to look broadly to help really kind of encourage a lot of different resources. That also helps keep, uh, keeps the power reliable, affordable, um, you know, and addresses some of those issues as well. So this is for Catherine Bond. In your opening remarks, you mentioned that batteries are needed to improve the, um, that seems, and I'm just reading this, that seems, um, to throw up your hands about decreasing carbon emissions, given that allow uh, eliminating GHG emissions is essential, what is Dominion doing? Um, greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas. Okay. Right. Um, over the course of the last several years, Dominion has reduced its rate of carbon emissions by more than 50% and by more than 90%, 95% actually. Um, other types of emissions. And we've done that through a combination of approaches while maintaining low rates and reliable service for our customers. Um, that's meant retiring some coal plants. It's been converting some of those other coal plants to cleaner burning uh, natural gas. Um, also having some of those plants converted to biomass. We're investing in significant amounts of solar energy. Um, so to put that in perspective, just in 2015, we had about one megawatt of solar in Virginia. Um, that again is enough to serve about 250 customers. Um, today, based on what's operational or under development or under construction just in Virginia, we're at about 840 megawatts. So substantial improvements in just the last few years. Again, um, undertaking the offshore wind project, which we view as an important first step 
in a larger scale deployment of offshore wind off the coast of Virginia. So a number of steps have been taken. Uh, I mentioned battery storage because again, one of the, whether it's battery storage or any, there's other forms of energy storage, not just batteries, but I'll say energy storage in general is essential to um, moving in the direction the way a lot of the folks in the panel have talked about tonight because it takes these resources that are carbon free um, renewable resources and then turns them into dispatchable resources that again we can call upon when you flip the switch at your home or your business so we can serve you um, when you want to consume energy um, when you flip that switch so all of those things in addition to modernizing the grid none of them happen overnight um, but we're certainly moving in the right direction um, so here's a question about the grid. How do we, how do microgrids operate optimally within the grid, and what can consumers do to promote the development of renewable energy microgrids? I'm happy to talk a little bit about this because we're in the process of developing a microgrid. Um, so the concept for a microgrid is to, like the name implies, create a smaller grid sort of within the larger grid. You can think of this as like an electrical gated community, if you will. So most of the time, the roads are open, the gates are open, the microgrid is just connected to the grid at large, and service continues as normal. Um, the nice thing about the microgrid is that it has a lot of on-site generation, batteries, this can be battery storage, solar, wind, this can be some combined heat and power units, whatever sort of generation mix you'd like to see, and it's sort of within the confines of your microgrid, so that if there's an emergency and the power goes out, you can close the gates, Right, separate yourself from the grid at large and continue kind of service as normal just within this microgrid. Um, this is really a, a sort of a nice concept because it, 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 it makes your power more resilient, right? Um, right now, there can, we have the possibility of very widespread outages. If, if you remember the, the Northeast blackout, that was some years ago now, right? That actually started in Ohio and you had these cascading series of failures all up into the system. Um, so if we start to move toward this sort of microgrid architecture with, again, more local generation that is, so you can sort of make your electrons, you know, organically, they're, they're locally sourced, um, then, then you, can, you can move to sort of a more resilient power supply. Yeah, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that's a, a really good description of microgrids. Um, you know, we're... It's an early sort of stage technology, right? So our industry really around the country is doing a lot of work with uh, Department of Defense installations, hospitals, universities, and others. Essential services is one good place to start with that. And it's, you know, like a lot of these technologies, right? A lot of, we're still, it's learning by doing and it's growing and, and microgrids are evolving and what we know about them and how they work and how they interact with the system uh, is evolving as well. So certainly another area of promise and there's a lot going on uh, to start to try to build out some of that and then see how it does interact with the grid. Great. Right. Um, this is a question about REGI. It's uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And uh, the, the questioner wants to know what uh, Virginia's involvement is in REGI. Uh, so uh, Virginia's current involvement in REGI is none. Yeah, it's not. It, it's not. Um, a part of uh, Reggie. There are currently uh, regulations moving through uh, state government that would regulate carbon in Virginia and um, try to think of the best way to describe this. Uh, uh, essentially kind of buddy up to Reggie without actually joining it. I guess if I can put it that way. Um, it, it would force the utility, it would, it would have the utilities uh, it would allocate certain carbon allowances to the utilities. The utilities would need to turn around and sell them into uh, what's called the, the Reggie consignment uh, market, which is essentially like the, th the thrift store of carbon <laughs> regulated, or of carbon allowances. Uh, they, would, they would be forced to sell all of those in and then uh, they would have to buy back what they needed in order to, to stay under the, the carbon cap. Um, so uh, those regulations themselves would that not actually have Virginia joining, formally joining Reggie, but it, it would kind of connect Virginia into that carbon trading uh, market. Is that an accurate description? Or did I just confuse everybody? <laughs> yeah, Ivy, do you want to add to that? Uh, I have, I, that's not, there is a, uh, there was a bill last year and, and the last previous few years 
that would have Dominion formally join Reggie Virginia. and the and the Virginia. Virginia, not just Virginia. Yeah, I'm sorry. Virginia joined. Yeah, the old Dominion joined. <laughs> <laughs> nice catch. Not the new, not I like that. Dominion. Um, the, the benefits of that is that then instead of just giving these allowances to the utilities to participate. Uh, the state could actually auction them and get a pool of money that it could put into uh, climate adaptation efforts, uh, supporting renewable energy, uh, supporting um, energy efficiency for uh, low income weatherization, that kind of thing. So there are hundreds of millions of dollars that, that could come into the state um, if that legislation were to pass. Yeah, I just um, I think that was a, a great description by Hayes of what Reggie is. It's a 10 state um, with Virginia about to link in, right? And that's for a lot of different reasons. They can't quite, it's just easier actually for Virginia to participate by linking than trying to sort of formally join. But we don't have the half hour for that. So, um, yeah, or the lead, legal that. degrees uh, to, to take care of it. But uh, just when we talked a long time ago, when we started, we were talking about how we're, how power gets dispatched and how things get brought in. And what Reggie does is for carbon uh, intensive resources, it's gonna add a price to that. So when they send their bids in, that makes that power that much more expensive, which means it's probably less likely, or it's gonna be farther along the dispatch curve. It may not make it because now it's too expensive. So that's part of what Reggie tries to do in setting a cap on carbon and you have to stay below the cap is it kind of adds a little price uh, to that electricity and therefore uh, if you will, favors uh, non-emitting renewables, uh, nuclear power, et cetera. So um, here's a, it's not actually a question, but I think it's someone who wants to discuss um, a concept called performance-based regulation. Is that? Yeah. We could hear from you all about what your thoughts are. Um, divesting Virginia pensions from, this is also another point, uh, what about our opportunity to, to divest Virginia pensions from fossil fuels. Um, also, here is NIPSCO and Excel Economics, long duration, low cost storage. I mean, there's a whole <laughs> laundry list here, uh, but not necessarily a question, but just to opening it up for discussion, um, if anybody has any comments about. They're, um, ju they've um, just divested from coal assets on a 10-year scale, and they're replacing them with renewables uh, and storage. Um, Excel has basically said they're not going to do any new gas generation, any new coal generation. They're going to use wind, solar, and storage as a, as a, firm, uh, a firm product that's cheaper than gas. Um, I, you know, I think Ivy has got the, the right idea where we want to be 100% uh, renewables. I think the uh, the 5,000 5,000 megawatt. Um, I won't call it a goal or a benchmark. I think it's it's a number that's thrown out that um, we're not meeting yet. And I think um, you know, in terms of meeting Ivy's goal of, of you know by by 2035, 100%. Um, from something where Dominion writes the legislation, bypasses legislative services, and then gives it to the legislature. Uh, Performance-based legislation takes the, the values of, uh, of what, what, what we value in our uh, energy grid, and the, the legislators drive it, and they set the metrics for what Dominion and APSCO and others gain profit from in, in their uh, regulatory structure. So um, in, in terms of opening up the, the market for these sorts of entrants to do distribution scale solar, to do, to, you know, to do, um, you know, do storage in every, every big box store in Virginia, to do solar on every warehouse in Virginia, um, uh, quite frankly, we're not doing enough. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any comments about that? I, so I can, I, I, I think that's a great description of really where we ought to be going. And, and one of the things that we uh, have been asking for from the governor or the legislature or the SEC is a comprehensive look at how we do energy. And one of the, uh, one of the real failings, in my opinion, of, of the 2018 legislation is that it approached grid transformation as uh, let's see what the utilities bring forward and want to do, rather than uh, looking at it the other way and say what would be in the public interest for Virginians. Yes. And yes. Uh, so we, uh, our recommendation, <laughs> our, our recommendation is that the, the state bring in outside experts uh, like the regulatory assistance project um, to uh, convene a group to, to take on that bigger issue and, and get to that direction. So really, thank you for bringing that up. So does anybody else have any comments about that or wanted to chime in? The, we, we have in Virginia, there is a, a work group going on. Is that not correct, Catherine? The, Are you talking about Meridian? Um, I think Meridian was gathering stakeholder input on like a um, there are, uh, you asked about Meridian. Mm -hmm. Meridian was gathering stakeholder input on um, four specific solar-related topics. Okay. But um, I know that the administration, uh, in developing their energy plan, which is due to be filed, I believe, October 1st, is that right, Hayes? Um, they've conducted a number of public listening sessions and stakeholder sessions leading up to that um, that publication. Yeah, and so I, I'll give uh, the, the uh, give the administration, the Northam administration, a lot of credit for a lot of things. Um, but with respect to their energy plan and stakeholder engagement, uh, they they've been spending all spring and summer um, doing a lot of that. Um, they have kind of five main buckets that they're focused on with respect to the Virginia energy plan, which is statutorily required to be done at the beginning of each administration, the governor has to say October 1 of his first term, this, these are my energy priorities for, for, my, for my four years. Um, they have done a couple of offshore wind stakeholder groups, the Meridian, which is dealing with uh, solar topics. They had a separate um, uh, stakeholder process for uh, other kind of issues that hit a couple of the different resources, corporate uh, procurement and, and um, and market access to renewable energy. Uh, they are working on an energy efficiency uh, working group. The Grid Transformation Security Act had uh, in it a requirement that the State Corporation Commission facilitate a comprehensive energy efficiency stakeholder group as well. So there are a lot of conversations going on. Um, the, the passage and the signing of the Grid Transformation Act uh, was not the end of the conversation. It actually sparked a lot of other conversations that I think will be going on uh, for the next few years to, to try and drive some of these uh, some of these issues um, that, that have been raised tonight. Great. So um, now we'd like to discuss how to drive down and control demand, the demand side through energy efficiency. It's not something that we've really uh, delved into yet. How do we, for instance, encourage landlords to make uh, rentals more efficient? Um, and make more incentives at the local level with owners and um, residents to uh, mm -hmm. use energy more wisely. I know that in other parts of the world they've been more successful than we have. Uh, yeah, if I could, this is the, the world that I work in and my job is in Washington and most of my work is in Maryland. Um, there's a reason for that. They actually have well-established programs that have been funded, uh, they're actually the Maryland programs funded through ratepayers in order to drive energy efficiency programs. Um, Maryland, since 2008, spent about $1, one billion on energy efficiency improvements. Um, they estimate that for every dollar they've spent, they've saved a dollar eighty in cost on the consumer side. So it's a really good economic driver in terms of the money that gets saved <coughs> and, it's, and it's very efficient. Now, if we think about that $1 billion and we think about Maryland versus Virginia, their electric uh, demand is about half our size. So if we're talking about a billion dollars over the next 10 years um, on double that size, I think we really are just starting to scratch the surface on energy efficiency. 
Um, my calculations are that that energy efficiency number um, for every dollar we spend on energy efficiency are for, for every um, each kilowatt hour we save on energy efficiency cost us about 2.8 cents. And so if we spend a billion dollars and that actually gets spread out over 10 or 11 years based on how long those energy efficiency measures last, we're probably looking at maybe a three or four percent savings. Um, probably to be on track with where we need to be in terms of these um, deep decarbonization strategies, um, that's maybe half, maybe if we're generous, of what the pace we need to be on in terms of energy efficiency. Um, I think energy efficiency is hugely um, undervalued. The other thing that you see, and I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but I've got reports I can pull up that show it's one of the biggest job creators in this field. Um, my job is energy efficiency. There are laborers who install equipment and systems. Um, there are you know, accountants and other people who are involved with uh, dealing with these things that all this work that comes out of that. And again, Maryland's calculation is for every dollar they've spent is saved a dollar eighty for their and the manufacturing of the equipment. And a, a lot of that, the, those resources like they have in Maryland, some of that came from Reggie. Um, there, there was the, 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 the taxes on the, the, the credits, the emission credits, were what funded a lot of these, those energy efficiency projects in, in Maryland. So it really has worked out pretty well for everybody concerned. If I can add just one other just sort of anecdotal example, we had a client that uh, we did a relatively low cost study for. It was funded through BG&E and we saved them over $100,000 a year in energy savings and they spent about 40,000 on that effort. So um, now that was a, a great case because they had some real low hanging issues there. But it, it really is, I think, can be a multiplier in these efforts in pushing us forward. So can you give us a little, I mean, that sounds amazing. What's holding us up in Virginia from doing that? Right. We haven't had a mandated regulated. So, so the programs typically work through the utilities, and, and that's what Maryland does. So it's mandated. It's called the Empower Program. And so the state has passed laws. They had a 15% goal that they had to get to by 2015, I believe. And now they are going to go 2% a year incrementally for the next, I think it's five to 10 years. And so we haven't had that legislation in Virginia that's pushed it. I think the grid transformation and um, Security Act is a great step forward. I think we can do more. I would challenge that we should do more. I think it's a minimum number is 840 million for Dominion and 170 for Appalachia, or uh, it's somewhere in 870 and 140 are the numbers. Um, so we haven't had those real mandatory push. It's been a voluntary, I think, energy efficiency program is what was in place before. So we have a good step there, but I think we really can push that even farther and get more benefit. And so. Uh, Again, I'll take my um, offshore wind hat off and, um, you know, Dominion can't decide we're going to do an energy efficiency program and then do it. There is a regulatory structure in place by which they have to go and get approval to recover costs to, to do these types of programs. And the regulator uh, has been traditionally very skeptical of the value of energy efficiency as a quote unquote resource uh, for consumers. And so that presents a challenge in and of itself. Um, <coughs> utility programs are, uh, can be effective ways to drive um, reduced consumption. Um, Non-utility programs can also be effective ways. So a couple of examples that uh, are in, in Virginia, one is called Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, there is a local option uh, in Virginia um, where localities can put in place uh, a PACE program that allows um, a business owner to make improvements that reduce their own consumption on a building and then essentially pay those improvements as a special tax assessment. And so it re reduces um, the administrative burden on particular uh, businesses that want to do that type of stuff but don't necessarily have the education or, or, or uh, want the improvements to be attached to the building and not necessarily a business liability on the business itself. The other is called energy performance contracting. And that's something uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia and localities in Virginia have done uh, a lot of, which is essentially um, financing uh, or funding improvements um, through the savings that those improvements generate. So you go in and you replace a chiller, you, uh, you replace um, windows, you put in uh, smart meters um, that ultimately reduce, or, or smart uh, thermostats that reduce your consumption 
and there are companies out there that allow you to finance that and pay back that loan that you take out with the money that you're saving or a portion of the money that you're saving by virtue of those improvements. So creative financing is another way to drive energy efficiency, uh, especially in the commercial sector. So that's where a lot of the, 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 the challenges uh, lie. But it, you know, there are regulators in place uh, that say yay or nay to the utilities on whether or not they can actually do programs. And those regulators in Virginia have traditionally been challenging with respect to energy. I, I might mention that the uh, um, Fairfax County government is looking at, at doing a, a developing a, a CPACE uh, commercial property assessed uh, clean energy um, ordinance uh, right as we speak. Um, and then the other thing is the, the Fairfax County schools are using a um, uh, an energy, which is, which is the energy performance based uh, contracting uh, for their their programs, and it's proven to be very successful for the for Fairfax County schools. So, so is that something that we could implement in a broader scope in Virginia? Is uh, what would stop us from being able to do something like that at a at a bigger scale? Um, the property assessed uh, uh, clean energy one one of the one of the problems is each each locality, each hundred and whatever it is localities, has to develop their own regulation. And so far, only Arlington has actually developed a, an ordinance. Um, and uh, Loudoun County has, 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 is looking at it. Um, there's a, a lot of localities that are looking at it. I know that in Fairfax County, they kind of want somebody else to go first. And you know, if, if you always want somebody to go first, then nothing actually happens. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think also building codes or something. If we could toughen up our building codes for the state, we could lower our, um, increase our energy efficiency. And I believe that that's regulated at the state. Fairfax County told me that they could not do it because the state told them how it had to be. So that comes back to our state legislators. I'll have to confess in terms of the what they're authorized at the state level. I'm not into those details. I know that our building codes in Virginia don't drive much of the business that I'm in uh, because they are relatively minimal. Um, because we took ARRA money uh, during the uh, um, economic crisis, there was a criteria that we had to step up the level of codes because of certain monies we took then. So that was a step forward. And as far as I know, that was the last kind of step forward. Um, Alexandria, Arlington, I think sometimes is called the People's Republic of Arlington. <laughs> they push the limits on that. And um, so there are some things we can do, but it would certainly be good, I think, to have it pushed from the state level. Again, what I see in Maryland and D.C. in particular, I'm going to a, D.C. is targeting net zero building requirements by 2030. So I'm going to a seminar tomorrow on that. So, you know, there are much more aggressive things we can do in the built environment. And the built environment is about 30% of our um, energy demand, I believe the numbers, I'm starting to, all the numbers are late in the night. But, so it's, it's a big sector, and we really have a lot of room that we can do with building codes, and that'll be another element that we should be talking about in Richmond, what we can do to, to push and that. the turnover of, of the fleet is, is huge. I mean, it's very long. Uh, you wanted to say something quick? Uh, on, on the building codes, the process in Virginia is about two and a half to three year long process. Um, it is very complicated. It involves a lot of stakeholders. It's done through the Department of Housing and Community Development and their board. Um, this last uh, cycle, um, actually in, in Virginia, traditionally the commercial standards that are kind of adopted at the international level are adopted wholesale at the state level. It's the residential side from the building code standpoint in Virginia where they have uh, some of the energy efficiency uh, components have been um, dialed back somewhat from kind of the recommended international standards. Uh, there was some incremental progress made in the last round, uh, but that the next cycle is actually starting up again now. Um, about the third year of the administration uh, is generally when the building codes are finalized for the next cycle. So it is a constantly iterative process, um, but it, it, but you're exactly right. It's done at the state level. It's not done at the do you have something quick? Yeah, yeah. The, um, it's it's been the the home builders who have been the problem. So they're uh, they're all about keeping home prices as cheap as possible on the at the point of sale, and so they don't want 
energy, anything energy efficiency that adds to the initial sales cost of the house, even if the buyer would, would save money over the 30 year term of the mortgage. And so that's a, a real political pressure point that these are our political appointees on the housing board. It is usually the home builders who are, uh, are pushing the appointments. We've been working on this for years, trying to get stronger appointments because it is absolutely unconscionable that we are not building homes to the tightest possible standard today. It's just, it, with a climate crisis and you know you're saving money, it is, it is unbelievable that we are not mandating essentially net zero homes today. We know we can do it and, and yep. we can do that. Well, this has been great. Um, unfortunately, we have to be out of here by nine o'clock. Um, and so I want to try to get uh, one, um, one final question for everybody on the panel. And this is kind of your, 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 your uh, uh, time to really uh, think about what you want to do for the future. Um, what, can the, what can the legislature do to support rapid transition to 100% renewable? And that's for everybody. Um, I'm going to start with me, Eric, in Virginia. Sure. Well, I think there's a. I mean, I think we've heard a lot of different policy prescriptions talked about tonight that the legislature can take to advance clean energy. Um, you know, anything you can do to improve the permitting and siting, anything you can do to improve the penetration. Uh, I think we don't want to get lost on the technology development side. So uh, that's a bit more at the federal level. States have a role. Uh, but you want to keep you know, pushing and finding out what is that next technology, because we just don't know yet. Um, but there's a lot more you can do to enhance energy efficiency um, and to bring these resources on. And I think you know, um, as a legislature, taking that long-term view of where do we want to be and how do we want to get there. And I think the other critical role that we haven't had a chance to really talk about is uh, bringing in electrification and trying to bring in transport uh, and promoting more electric vehicles, electric transport, more metro. Um, that's a way of kind of sharing the benefit with the whole community, uh, and it's a great way to really get at the whole carbon issue, which I think is kind of at the heart of a lot of this, trying to decarbonize. Well, so to do something sort of as dramatic as moving to 100% renewables, I don't think we're going to get there iteratively, right? What we've, what we've been doing to get us where we are isn't going to get us, isn't going to get us where we want to go. So I would say that if we want to take Virginia and, and transform our grid into something that is sort of the envy of the nation, perhaps even the world, um, we really have to harness the, the, you know, the, the demand side resources, the electrical devices that are in the homes and the buildings of everyone here. Um, so to that end, I would say that the legislature sh should support like a marketplace for the energy services of these devices. So something that really untaps the smart grid potential. Of, of anything that touches the grid, anything that uses electricity, like, again, so that they can all work together um, toward a smarter, cleaner grid. I think you have a detailed prescription here. Well, um, I, there, yeah, there'd be a lot of things that I think the legislature could do, um, starting with mandatory energy efficiency and renewable energy standards. Uh, breaking down all these barriers to uh, distributed solar so that you can be putting solar on landfills and airports and uh, unused spaces and letting uh, apartment building owners sell the output of solar panels to the tenants uh, and you know, just, just breaking down this whole host of, of barriers. Um, but I also think the legislature needs to change it's understanding on natural gas. And one of the problems we have is, is that people focus on the carbon side, but not the methane side. Yeah. And so talking about, yeah. talk, talking about uh, lowering carbon emissions by switching from coal to natural gas without talking about the methane is, is it's like, saying you got a, a great deal on a house and the only downside is it doesn't have a roof and two walls. <laughs> it's, it's just not that great a deal. So, so and it, but the, you know, we're, we talk a lot about carbon so that tends to get lost that, that we, we really need to persuade people that it's gotta be a, a truly renewable 
energy and and uh, and get to that conversation. So we're talking about solutions to the right problems. I know you have comments. Sure, sure. So um, I, I think the first thing, and I want to uh, open my comment by uh, thanking Delia Boyska for holding this conversation because I think the first step is actually having the conversation. I was struck in last election year that we didn't talk about this much at all. So thank you for hosting this. So um, not so long ago, um, in a certain phase of my life, I was told that if uh, you want to get out of a hole, the first thing you need to do is stop digging. And so when it comes to carbon emissions, if we want to stop carbon emissions, the first thing we need to do is stop investing in carbon intensive resources. Yeah. And so I think on the near term, and Ivy makes some good points, I'm not sure how we 100% get there. I love to get to the 100%. But in the near term, one of the things that I would say we should do is we should immediately say that we want to see those 5,500 megawatts of renewable energy built first before we build any new fossil fuel infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. And, uh, zero, zero carbon engineers are working with Delegate David Reed on legislation along those lines, and I understand you've indicated you would sign on as a co-sponsor. So I think that's number one, what we can do right now, and I think has some viability in the current political climate. We have to realize our legislature is still dominated or controlled by the Republicans. Secondly, we need to be very clear on that there has to be this ultimate end goal. I still contend that that should be zero carbon by the middle of the century, but until we put that goal out there and then begin building the foundations and the pathways to that, it is this incremental steps and we're not getting to that big thing. So we need that big goal and we need to agree to it. Whether we do it through renewable portfolio standard or some other method, I don't know what that is, but that has to be part of the conversation and that needs to be put in place. And last, I think we really have to think about how we regulate the utilities. Um, when you read the integrated resource plan, what you see is that um, Dominion has three main things that they're working on. They work on meeting supply, and I'm sure if I read Appalachian's resource plan, they'd be the same, but they're so long I can't read both of them. Um, <laughs> second, they want to comply with regulation. They look at whether it's Reggie or the Clean Power Plan, how do we comply with regulation? And third, because this is what the law tells them, they figure out how do we do it at the cheapest cost? And of course, in the background, they're for profit, so they're looking at how we lower risk and maximize profits. That's the game we've put in place. That is the game that's played. It gives us what we have today. We have to rethink that structure, and we have to really address that. So this idea of legislative assistance and looking at that, um, I think Ivy said it already and articulated very well, we really have to grapple with that problem. And the last thing I would say is um, when we look at resources, we have resources now that were built in the 60s that you know, we're producing electricity not so long ago. The decisions we make today will affect where we are mid-century. So we do not have time to delay. We have to move quickly and assertively in the right direction for getting decarbonized <coughs> our economy. Um, I would uh, concur with several of the remarks that were made. Um, I think that again, the legislation that passed this session, we shouldn't just breeze over that. Um, now we really we have to implement it. It's not just about getting legislation passed. It's what do we do with it now that it's here. Um, we filed a request for the first phase of grid modernization that's absolutely essential to providing our customers the kind of tools we've been talking about and to help update our grid and um, from what was designed mid-century, last century, to something with a two-way flow of energy in mind to help us meet our customers' needs reliably. Um, at a low cost and also understand that not every customer uses energy the same way. So um, all that needs to be factored in as well. Um, so how do we get to 100? It's, uh, so I, I, I think it's, imp it's important. It's not something that's been um, kind of dug into too much here, but people have – Everybody needs to have a, a good sense of what they mean when they think 100% renewable or what they mean when they think a zero carbon future. Because those things can align in some cases, they can not align. Nuclear, I think, is, a, is kind of the, the perfect intersection of that question because technically nuclear is zero carbon, uh, but is it a renewable resource? Um, so just with that caveat in mind, I think in Virginia, 
things that resonate with policymakers and opinion leaders across Virginia are uh, economic development. So when we think about what resources we're looking to deploy, uh, when we think about renewable resources, when we think about energy storage, if we talk about it in the context of the value that they create beyond simply the resource itself, that's going to resonate and that's going to move us more quickly into uh, higher penetration of renewable energy. Energy efficiency creates a tremendous number of jobs. Energy storage is a huge kind of untapped opportunity that a state, if it really grabs hold of it, can, can drive a lot of economic value. Offshore wind mm -hmm. is a huge opportunity for the entire state, but especially for a part of the state that is over-reliant, uh, more so than many other parts, on the federal government. And having an, a, an economic value that kind of shaves the peaks and valleys of defense spending uh, is an incredibly valuable economic resource. Um, so I think in Virginia, um, we can get there to 100% renewable or zero carbon, however you, you want to define it, uh, if we are talking about it in the context of additional value that it creates for, the, for Virginia, for the Virginia economy, and for Virginia ratepayers. Because Virginia ratepayers are also Virginia citizens, and a good economy benefits everybody. Well, I want to thank you all for spending the evening with us tonight. Um, this is a difficult conversation and it's really complex. And I know there's a lot of passion around it and a lot of concern as we've seen. We know that climate change is real. Um, we know that it's affecting our globe in a way that is dangerous and harmful. And I am just really pleased that we got a diverse group of people here to talk um, that's, you know, to have some concrete ideas about what we can do in the future. Um, in the General Assembly, we've seen a big shift in the makeup of the General Assembly, and it's my hope that over the next couple of years, we'll be able to institute some real meaningful change that is going to be attainable for us so that we can see a, a positive future and get to that 30, you know, 2035 zero carbon renewable energy. I'd like to thank Eric Holdsworth for being here, Will G Gethright, Ivy Maine, Scott Emery, Catherine Vaughn, Hayes Fromming, and of course our wonderful um, moderator.